At Cars.com, we spend a lot of time reviewing and driving cars for the masses. But there are those times when we get together with cars that are really, really fun to drive regardless of their limitations. This summer, we've gotten a bunch of those cars and we wanted to bring them together for you. We've got domestic badasses, we've got European newbies, and we have a whole lot of power, sound, and fury. We'll start off with the hellacious new Hellcat Challenger from Dodge, and then the blazingly fun F-Type from Jaguar. And that, my friends, is the sound of 700 horsepower. It wasn't long ago when 700 horsepower was just for race cars, just for supercars. We're here with the 2015 Dodge Challenger SRT Hellcat, and its 707 horsepower supercharged V8 is the most extreme Challenger that you can buy. Now, a lot goes into making that monster of an engine work with the rest of the Challenger. So let's take a look at what goes into the Hellcat and we couldn't make a Challenger Hellcat video without taking it to the track. The engine itself is 91% new compared to the 6.4 liter on which it's based. And there are a lot of different systems that go into supporting that much power. On the outside, you have this new hood. Now it has functional heat extractors and it's been off for a while and it's still pumping out heat. Down at the headlight level, the inboard driver side headlight is removed and in its place is an air intake that goes straight to the engine's airbox. Down a little lower, there are no fog lights. Instead, it's just open grill space to get as much air as possible into the coolers and heat exchangers behind that grill. The brakes are the largest that Chrysler has put on any of its vehicles at 15.4 inches with six piston calipers. That's even larger than the Dodge Viper. Now over to the transmission choices, you have an eight speed automatic transmission and a six speed manual transmission. The six speed manual is taken directly out of the Viper and eight speed automatic is beefed up and it's the most stout eight speed that Chrysler makes. Out back, you have beefed up rear end and axle components, and you have this exhaust, this wonderful, wonderful exhaust. It's two and three quarter inch dual pipes with an active exhaust system, and let me tell you, it is an experience unlike anything else out there. If the makers of Godzilla are looking for something new to sample for a monster sound, they gotta get a hold of one of these. The Hellcat is as rock as fast and wild as you'd expect, but it's also extremely controllable and it can be very, very mild when you have all the modes dialed down a little bit. Maybe it's a long wheelbase or the 4,400 pound curb weight, but it never feels white knuckled or like you're not in control. And then when you do turn all of those modes down to eco and street settings, you can drive this thing like a V6. You can drive it all day long in the city, hit every pothole and be in complete comfort. But then you get out on the highway and you stretch its legs and just unleash the 707 horsepower, which is a very wild experience. The Hellcat's 8.4 inch touchscreen houses the command center for numerous power, transmission, and suspension settings. The Hellcat has three pre-programmed driving modes, default, sport, and track. But beyond that, you can customize each individual setting of the transmission, suspension, and power output. In the custom setup, you can choose between 700 horsepower, 500 horsepower, or transmission in track, sport, and street modes. There's also an eco mode that numbs down all of the settings and makes this just powerhouse as drivable as a V6 in heavy, heavy traffic. Now there's more information in the center dashboard. The digital display between the tachometer and speedometer houses a lot of interesting information that people who are going to be driving on the track are going to want to see. Individual items like intake air temperature, intercooler temperature, temperature of the transmission, oil temperature, there's just a huge amount of information available. And it's available in the digital display and also set up as gauges in the performance pages of the 8.4 inch display. 
Now on top of that, you also have a diagnostic center here that can show you diagnostic trouble codes as they pop up if there's anything wrong with the car. Quarter mile times for the Hellcat are estimated by Dodge at a blistering 10.8 seconds in the quarter mile, but with sticky drag radial tires. Now on street tires, they say it should do 11.2 seconds. We're gonna put that to the test, so let's head to the drag strip. We've been able to pull some mighty impressive times in the Challenger Hellcat. Now 707 horsepower may seem excessive, and it is, but it works in the Hellcat. Anything less than ludicrous, and this thing just would not have stood out as the way it does. This is a 2014 Jaguar F-Type. It's called the F-Type because it is the spiritual successor to the classic E-Type coupe. Um, as such, it's arguably the only pure sports car the Jaguar has had in decades. Now there's some changes in the styling of the F-Type, even when you compare it with a lot of the other modern designs in Jaguar's lineup. Uh, to my eye, it looks a little bit Japanese actually in front. Um, but put Japan aside, the uh, English designers actually say that one of the influences for the headlights was, and I'm not making this up, Darth Vader's TIE Fighter from Star Wars. I'm not sure I actually see it, but if you think about it, the Empire, full of Brits. There are currently three trim levels for the F-Type. There's the base, which has a supercharged 3-liter V6 engine with 340 horsepower. There's the F-Type S, same engine, more power, 380 horsepower. And then you have what we have behind me here, and that is the F-Type V8 S. It has a 5-liter V8, also supercharged, and 495 horsepower. The real telltale sign is the exhaust pipes. You can get two big bore exhausts in the center if it has a V6 engine. The V8 has the quads like this one. Now we're just a couple months away from getting a coupe version of the F-Type in the United States as a 2015 model, but Jaguar started with the convertible, the two-seater, the Roadster, um, and they chose to go with a powered fully automatic soft top. Uh, I think it was a good move. For one thing, it opens or closes in 11 seconds, which is really quick. It happens even at speeds up to about 30 miles per hour, so if it starts to rain or something, you don't have to pull over and put it in park, which you do with a lot of the re retractable hardtops. Now, typical of two-seat vehicles, there's actually enough space for a larger adult. I'm six feet tall and I have plenty of leg room, especially considering that, unfortunately, there is no stick shift version available, at least not yet so I'm able to sit back a little bit farther. And as for headroom, I have to say, lots of really generous vertical motion on the adjustable seat. With the top up, I've got about you know, this much space to spare. And then if you're a shorter driver, you'll find it goes up several inches, quite far, far enough that I couldn't sit comfortably with the top up. Uh, and that really makes it versatile, especially with the memory settings here for two drivers of different statures. Jaguars often surprise people with how uh, engaging they are to drive, how sporty, even the ones that don't look that sporty. Uh, this car definitely dials it up. Uh, it has excellent handling, really good weight distribution front to rear. I feel like the V8 version is a little bit nose heavier. There's more push in the corners. Uh, would make sense with a larger engine in front. Uh, good precise steering. I think it's a little bit twitchy at high speeds, depending on the road surface, though some of my colleagues didn't have as much of a problem with it. We all seem to agree that there could be better steering feedback, but we've also said the same thing recently of the Porsche Boxster and Cayman, which are in some ways comparable cars. Um, as for acceleration, really, really nice. 5.1 seconds to 60 miles per hour in the base version, 4.8 seconds in the F-Type S, and in this version, 4.2 seconds to 60 miles an hour. Unfortunately, at this time, there's no manual transmission, though it's possible we'll get one in the future. What you get instead is an eight-speed automatic. It is not a dual-clutch automated manual. It's conventional, but it is nice and quick. Not a lot of lag. I don't have much trouble with it. It's a regular drive mode. You can move the stick over and get a sport mode that holds the lower gears longer. And it also comes with paddle shifters, as so many cars do these days here on the steering wheel. Unfortunately, they have a rubbery feel. It is just not classy. One of the best features in the F-Type is the dynamic mode. What's great about this is it lets you set up your own profile here in the dynamic eye page 
where you can either use factory or my setup where you choose dynamic or regular for the engine response, the steering assist, suspension level, uh, the way the transmission uh, responds as well, and then all you have to do at any time is flip that lever once and it does what you want it to. Now we've seen this in BMW and a couple other manufacturers, but it's still pretty rare. Great to have here. Now, like other Jaguars and Land Rovers, the philosophy here for feature control is a simple touchscreen. Uh, thankfully, unlike some of the recent Land Rovers, uh, there are real buttons flanking the screen instead of uh, the touch sensitive panels. Uh, I'd say this system is a little bit outdated um, and actually a little slow to react, which is a bit of a pain in the butt, uh, but otherwise it generally does the job. Uh, one of the interesting things about this car, like so many Jaguars, is it has lots of theater, uh, T-H-E-A-T-R-E -E in the British style. Uh, for example, when you first get in, the engine start-stop button is flashing red like a heartbeat. Uh, a couple other things, when you turn the air on, for example, the vents kind of rise up. There's no reason for this, by the way. You can see over them, so it's all just, you know, a surprise and delight, as they call it. Also, you notice there's a little seat icon on the dial here. When you push on it, there's a little animation that shows you rotate this way to turn the seat heat on. That's pretty neat. I think the most useful of these features, motorized features at least, is in the stick shift. When you have it in S mode um, to the left for the transmission sport mode, you go to push the park button and it will not uh, go into park. Instead of beeping at you and telling you to move the shift lever over, it does it by itself. This brings us to what I consider the F-Type's uh, biggest shortcoming. It's not uncommon for a small car like this to have a small trunk. Uh, the problem here is that the seven cubic feet, which sounds decent, is actually strangely distributed. Uh, I, I'm not saying you couldn't get a set of golf clubs in here if you made a real big effort, but it's not terrific. What you'll see is there's one deep well that nothing of normal size will fit in except maybe a backpack and then everything else is just kind of short and wide you can stick some stuff in under there so uh, it's a common issue with small cars but the shape itself is definitely a problem here we're big fans of the Jaguar XK coupe and convertible uh, but those are more touring cars than this they have four seats uh, this thing on the other hand definitely the real deal it is a blast to drive Jaguar's been out of this game for a long time really good to have him back. Love drama? Go on a first date. My passion is puppetry. Here? I think we're done here. Hate drama? Go to cars.com. Research. Price. Find. Only cars.com helps you get the right car without all the drama. You can get a fair amount of performance in a small package, and a good example of that is the 4C, a new sports car from Alfa Romeo, which is making its return to the U.S. Let's see if it lives up to the hype. But first, we'll get behind the wheel of the new CLA 45 AMG from Mercedes-Benz. Mercedes-Benz is in the habit of making high-performance AMG versions of almost every model it builds in the U.S. these days, and so it didn't take long to figure that the new bargain-priced CLA class would sprout one. And here we have it, finally the all-new CLA 45 AMG. So let's see how it does. The CLA 250 already comes with a turbocharged 2.0-liter 4-cylinder. Its AMG sibling also has a 2.0-liter turbo 4, but here it's good for 355 horsepower, 332 pounds-feet of torque. With all-wheel drive and a dual-clutch 7-speed automatic transmission, Mercedes says this thing hits 60 in just 4.5 seconds. Pretty good, right? Unfortunately, most of that seat of your pants kind of feeling of power doesn't really come till three, 4,000 RPM on the tack. I blame some of that on the transmission. It upshifts very smoothly, but delays on downshift sometimes uh, hunts gears as it's trying to kick down two, three gears at the same time, especially in the drivetrain's C mode. That stands for controlled efficiency. You might as well also say it stands for something like cut the fun or something. There's a sport mode, an S mode here. That does improve things a little bit, but overall the whole MO of the car seems to be upshift very soon and fight you on downshifts. Given how the balance of power is really at the top end of the tack, that doesn't really give it a visceral sense of fun unless you're throwing the car around. Do that and the CLA45 disguises its front wheel drive roots pretty well. 
The all-wheel drive system biases power up front under normal circumstances, and that does give the car a little bit of nose heaviness as you're kind of initially starting that turn in into a corner. But over long sweepers, it's pretty easy to get the rear end to come out into play uh, with just the gas pedal. Now, our car has the base AMG Sport suspension. There is an optional AMG Performance suspension, but as it stands, body roll isn't too much. Easy to kind of throw this car around. Steering isn't lightning quick, but it's good enough to play along and definitely makes the car fun, uh, nimble in corners, a lot of fun to take on a back road. All of that comes in a package that's okay as far as drivability is concerned. Mercedes' tradition of accelerator lag seems to be alive and well here. It's not as bad in the CLA as it is in some of the automakers' larger cars, but even in sport mode, the 45 still takes kind of a beat getting off the line there. Uh, ride quality, again, this car has the AMG Sport suspension with 18-inch wheels, not 19s, and the performance suspension as it is. It's decent around town, a little bit bumpy, uh, but not out of what you'd expect for a performance car. Actually pretty livable on the highway, too. Now, our test car has the base seats uh, for the 45 AMG. Um, they hold you in pretty well in corners, uh, but the backrest is kind of flat, and the seat cushions at the bottom here are a little bit too small for my legs, and I'm six feet tall. Uh, there are AMG performance seats available. That's going to change the whole picture there, so check them out as well. Some of the CLA's bargain priced routes show through even in the AMG here. Uh, leather is optional in the 45. Uh, our car has MB text, that's fake leather upholstery. Doesn't really look or feel much like the real thing. Materials along the upper dash and the upper doors are fairly consistent, but there's kind of some hard parts here along the lower parts of the dashboard where your knees kind of potentially knock up against. These door locks, the stems here, they're from the old C-Class. They need to go like yesterday. They are horribly cheap. Between the BMW M235i and the Audi S3, the CLA45 AMG has a number of loose competitors. Typical of AMG cars, it kind of establishes itself as the performance tourer of the group with decent ride quality, but characteristic of its architecture, not so good visibility or headroom in the front or rear seats. It has its moments, but we're still scratching our head over pricing. Pricing starts for the CLA45 right under $50,000. That means it's actually the cheapest AMG you can buy right now in the United States. Uh, but it's also more than $15,000 above an all-wheel drive CLA 250. Uh, in terms of standard features that you get beyond the 250, Xenon headlights, a little bit of extra bodywork, and larger wheels, not a whole lot else. So really what you're paying for is the extra performance. Is that worth it? Mm, that's up to you. Alfa Romeo hasn't sold a car in the United States since the mid-1990s, but it is back, and it is back big with the 2015 4C Coupe. Uh, now, this is being positioned as something of a supercar. What is a supercar? Well, typically it has exotic looks. Check. It has exotic performance. Check. And it has an extremely high price tag. This car starts with destination at just over $55,000. That's not a bad thing. Now, the 4C is a mid-engine coupe. That is something that's still rare in the American market. Its best-known competitor is the Porsche Cayman. Like the Cayman, it is mid-engine, meaning the engine is behind the cabin, but slightly in front of the center line of the rear axle. And you can see it right through the window. So what powers this little supercar? It is a 1.75 liter four-cylinder engine, if you can believe it. Now, even though it's that small, it puts out 273 horsepower, 285 pounds-feet of torque. It does that because it is turbocharged, and it takes more than 21 pounds of boost. That's a lot from 91 octane gasoline. Now you'll also notice back here is your only cargo area. This happens to be a car cover. Uh, it has about 3.7 cubic feet of storage. That is really, really, really small. Uh, the Porsche Cayman has, for example, 15 between a rear and front trunk. And even a Mazda Miata has five. Now Alpha has gone to great lengths to keep this car lightweight. And one of the ways they've done that is with the use of carbon fiber. Now, we're not talking about a carbon fiber roof or hood or certainly not trim. We're talking about the tub, the structure of this car. Uh, you can see it on the sill here, the door jam, just about everywhere. Uh, that is a big, big step to reduce weight while maintaining strength. The body panels are composite, another step to keep things light. One of the things I find interesting about the 4C is how much it combines uh, super modern technology like a highly turbo boosted four cylinder engine and the carbon fiber with some old school stuff. Uh, kind of like how hard it is to get in and out. It's a very wide sill. It's a very low car. Now, once you're in, 
if you are a taller person, you're actually not in bad shape. Plenty of leg room. Headroom is a bit limited, certainly. One of the hallmarks of a mid-engine car is excellent handling. Um, and Alfa Romeo takes it to another level with manual steering. Uh, manual steering is something you don't see that much anymore. Uh, it is both a step to minimize weight and also to improve feedback. Aside from it needing more muscle at low speeds, uh, you do get a lot more feedback, which is fantastic. It's a very direct feel. Um, but you also tend to have to work at it a little bit more. Uh, part of having that feedback is the steering wheel, the whole system reacts to hitting bumps and such. Uh, so on the highway, eh, you're doing a little bit more work. And that actually can add to a fatigue factor if you're trying to drive this car as a daily driver. Fortunately, the car is really controllable with the manual steering. Uh, the only real X factor is a little bit of turbo lag. So you get sometimes a peak that'll start to kick the rear end out, uh, but you can counter it, get it back under control. Uh, for a car with that much weight in the back, it's both entertaining and pretty safe. Now, one of the ways that the 4C is a little bit old school is the ride quality. You can get a new sporty or sports car these days that rides really nicely. Uh, this one, even with the regular suspension, it's called the sport suspension, but it's not the racing suspension, uh, it rides very firmly. Um, it's certainly livable. If you're buying a car like this, you might not mind, but you're not going to mistake this for something else. Zero to 60 is between four and five seconds. Um, you hit the gas and it goes like a rocket, bangs off shifts with the dual clutch automated manual transmission very quickly with a great bark sound. Um, really nice. Now, purists are going to wish they had a stick shift. I, uh, unfortunately, am going to have to agree. But as these dual clutch automatics go, it's a pretty good one. Um, there's no idle creep when you come off the brake. It just kind of uh, sits there until you give it some gas, but the transition isn't bad. Uh, the upshifts, again, very quick. The downshifts are a little bit of a disappointment, I must say. Uh, in the regular mode, uh, they can be a little bit slow, and if you use the shift paddles on the steering wheel here, uh, sometimes it'll stair step a bit down multiple gears. That does get a little bit better when you change the mode. The 4C's driving modes are controlled via a DNA selector. Uh, that stands, uh, we'll start with A, that is for all weather use. And uh, it cuts back on the throttle, makes the shift program more, you know, amenable to snow conditions, etc. Uh, beyond that, there's the N, which is for natural, I would just call it normal mode. And then if you hold the toggle switch up, that's dynamic mode. What that gives you is it holds on to gears, into higher revs, gives you a more sensitive throttle, etc. The obvious stuff. Now you can also go into a race mode by holding that switch up all the way. And that just dials up those settings a notch more and turns off the electronic stability control. Now the interior quality has gotten a lot of knocks for the base version, but I have to say for $27.50 you can get the leather package which adds uh, leather upholstery to the doors, the dash. Uh, we have leather seats in this one. Um, the bolsters are pretty prominent, uh, reasonably comfortable seats overall, I must say. I find the upper ones a little bit restrictive, uh, but I feel like you do need them because there's not much bracing in the car. You can't get your leg against the door. It's so far over here. The uh, center console is kind of low. Um, overall, I think the quality is good. Note that this test car is optioned up to over $64,000, and one of the option packages is the convenience package for $1,800. It includes things like cruise control, a backup sensor system, which is definitely welcome because there's practically no rear visibility, and a premium stereo that uh, both doesn't sound good, and I could not for the life of me figure it out. I, I, I mean, I didn't... Is that supposed to come off? Now, if you're looking for things like uh, cabin storage, there's really one cup holder, which is nice. This one is not so much of a cup holder. Uh, other storage options. I, I don't know what you'd call this, a, a pocket, a sleeve, something like that. And oh, here, I found the, uh, found the cabin storage. It's here. Now, there are a lot of cars out there that don't photograph as well as they look in person. This one photographs pretty well, but when you see it in person, it really is stunning. But it is not a car you buy just because you want a pretty car. Uh, because of what it's like to get in and out, the stiff ride, and especially the manual steering, um, you gotta really want it. There are definitely quieter cars 
There are uh, more refined cars, and actually the Porsche Cayman is one of them. But what I have to say is this car has a lot of heart. Um, it's a visceral experience, and, and between the sound uh, and the manual steering, you never forget that it's a machine. And for that, I kind of love it. Congrats on the new car. Thanks. The dealership reviews on cars.com made it easy, but... We thought it might be a little more tense. You missed the drama. Yeah. Ask him whatever you want. Okay. I think my sister's prettier than me. <laughs> Research. Price. Find. Only Cars.com helps you get the right car without all the drama. As we saw with the Mercedes, not every sports car needs to be a coupe. We've got a couple here that might fit your sporty sedan needs as long as you're willing to pay a little extra. First off is the WRX STI, Subaru's turbocharged performer. Next, we'll get behind the wheel of Porsche's four-door flagship, the Panamera. Ever since the fourth generation Subaru Impreza arrived in late 2011, performance enthusiasts have been hankering for its turbocharged WRX and even quicker WRX STI siblings. Well, here it is, the WRX STI, and it sure packs a punch, but maybe not enough to justify its price. We'll tell you why. The last STI came as a sedan or a hatchback. The new STI is sedan only. Not a lot of visual differences versus the WRX, which kind of already looked pretty extreme. Fits the STI a little more. Things like quad tailpipes, big fenders, stuff like that. Uh, an obvious difference between the two, one thing, is this rear wing sits much higher off the deck lid than the spoiler on the WRX. There's also 18-inch alloy wheels on the STI versus the 17s on the WRX. The seats have standard Alcantara inserts with red and black leather bolsters. Full leather seats are optional. The flat bottom steering wheel from the WRX carries over to the STI, but the STI is the only Impreza model to get dual zone automatic climate control instead of the single zone offered elsewhere. So if you have a spouse who's always too hot or too cold and you have to convince them that the STI is the only way they'll be comfortable, go nuts. Subaru's SI Drive controller sits down here. It can map accelerator response to normal, sport, or sport sharp modes uh, a little bit less intuitive to control just because it's down here versus the steering wheel buttons for SI Drive on the WRX. Now one of the things that continues to make the STI very unique uh, is this driver controllable center differential right here for the all-wheel drive system. It's got three automatic modes, even more manual modes, and it can vary the center differential from a full 50-50 lock, that means half your power is going up front, half the power is going to the rear, uh, all the way to a fairly open differential, um, not very interventionist there, with more of the power going to the rear wheels. Now if you have it in automatic modes, we've noticed that the car tends to understeer a little more, has a little bit more nose heaviness kind of dialed in. If you get it over to the manual modes though, the WRX STI behaves a a lot like a rear wheel drive car. You can really swing the tail out wherever and whenever. Same power situation as before with a horizontally opposed four cylinder engine that's turbocharged, good for 305 horsepower and 290 pounds feet of torque. Fire it all up and the STI is plenty quick, but only after a lot of turbo lag at the beginning. As another editor noted, it's quick, but doesn't feel that much quicker than the WRX. I gotta say, I kind of agree. The six-speed manual has short throws, but kind of a tall, wonky shifter. I'd trade it for the shorter shifter in the BRZ, the Subaru BRZ, any day. It does have evenly spaced gears all the way from first through sixth gear, though, so no big surprises there. The steering in the STI is a hydraulic setup, not electric power steering like in the WRX and the regular Impreza. A lot of fun on that front. You just point the nose, and it goes right there instinctively. Ride quality is another strong suit. The WRX STI rides a lot like the regular WRX, and that's generally a good thing. Now our car does have winter tires. Summer tires are standard. Those are certain to change road noise and ride quality, so keep an eye out for those on your test drive. Put all the pieces together, and the STI is a pretty mean little sedan, but it's also a pricey one. Pricing starts around $35,000, climbs to north of $40,000 for a fully equipped STI. That's a lot of money, even though it's roughly the same as the outgoing STI, because a base WRX starts around $27,000. At heart, the STI still looks like a heavily modified economy sedan. It would fit the bill if the bill were a little smaller. As it stands, Subaru makes the STI a bit of a hard sell. I'm here with the Porsche Panamera, now in its fifth year as Porsche's challenger to top shelf luxury flagship sedans. But the Panamera is technically not a sedan, it's actually a four seat hatchback and that makes for some interesting details. We'll show you more. 
if there's an elephant in the room with the Panamera, it has to be styling. It's been controversial ever since the car came out. Kind of a big, long, bloated tail sort of update on the 911. Even though the two are on completely different platforms, the Panamera is front engine, the 911 is rear engine here. Uh, there's an even longer version, believe it or not, now called the executive version of the Panamera. Uh, it adds about a half foot of overall length. Without the executive version, overall length under 200 inches, pretty small for this class, again, if you're comparing it to uh, flagship luxury sedans. A few changes for 2014 include updates to the front and the rear, uh, light updates there, plus new LED headlights. Let's get inside and take a look. The Panamera was one of the first cars to incorporate this sort of flowing waterfall kind of center stack design uh, with Porsche's traditional upright dashboard. That's sort of a look that's gone across the rest of Porsche's lineup and it's aged pretty well. Materials in our test car are pretty good, but there's a lot of buttons here kind of in the center area to sort through uh, temperature controls, things for the drivetrain. They're all kind of merged into this hodgepodge of buttons around the gear shift here. The seat remains a little sunken. It's kind of around a lot of furniture here, not a lot of room to stretch out, but very cocked pit like feel uh, certainly feels at home for Porsche enthusiasts back seat is pretty nicely packaged here again it's a two position back seat I'm six feet tall that's where I would sit to drive pretty good leg room left over as you can see and a good seating position height off the ground and good headroom left over often you have to get one but not the other uh, executive models have about five inches of additional leg room if you can believe it so probably a huge area back here and a practical advantage of hatchbacks the seats fold down, more than 40 cubic feet of maximum space with the seats down. Uh, obviously, a lot bigger path here to shove things through than even the folding back seat in just about any sedan. Drivetrains in the Panamera include a plug-in hybrid, a 310 horsepower V6, all the way up to a 570 horse twin turbo V8 capable of 0 to 60 in just 3.6 seconds. We have a Panamera 4S here. That means it has 420 horsepower, a turbocharged V6. It gets power to all four wheels via a PDK dual clutch automatic transmission. Let's go for a drive. The drivetrain is a bit of a sleeping giant in the Panamera 4S. There's a little bit of accelerator lag at first, and, and the transmission can take a few moments to kick down on the highway when you need it to. Uh, there's regular Sport and Sport Plus modes in our test car, uh, and in all but Sport Plus, it actually starts you off in second gear too, which is a little bit of a drag. Uh, once you lead foot kind of past all that, the Panamera 4S is a pretty quick car. The transmission shifts very, very quickly when it finally needs to. It can go down two or three gears right away. PDK, you could almost say, stands for pretty damn quick you know, if you spelled quick with a K. Porsche upgraded the suspension springs and bushings for 2014, and there are four possible suspension layouts. I won't bore you with all four, but our car does kind of have all the bells and whistles here. So an adaptive air suspension with anti-roll technology. Uh, the car corners pretty well. It doesn't drive like uh, a Cayman or a Boxer. It doesn't rotate that easily, uh, and the tail doesn't come out quite as quickly as it does on the 911, but it does come free like a proper rear drive car should. Uh, it's fun to play around on curvy roads in the Panamera. Uh, it behaves like a proper sports sedan in that way. The Panamera starts right around $80,000. That puts it in territory with other technical competitors like the Audi S7, RS7, the BMW 6 Series Grand Coupe. But once you get all the way up to the top trim levels, the Panamera can be optioned out all the way up to around $250,000. That's a huge spread for a car that really kind of defies classification. And that might be why you can't wait to buy one or you really can't stand it. You decide. That was a bunch, but we've got plenty more where those came from. Keep checking cars.com for the latest news and reviews.